few months ago, we recorded a conversation with David Reed. David Reed is a personal development leader, educator, and coach. He is a consulting partner for the Corporation for Positive Change, an organization that uses strengths and passions as fuel for inspired vision and action. He is also the founder of the Human Love Project, an experiential exploration of how we as human beings can deepen our capacity to love. So David Reed, welcome to Living Peace Podcast. Thank you, Henry. David, I, I just recently got to know you, and I, when we talked, I really was fascinated uh, with the work that you do. And the work that you do, it seems like, falls into two broad categories. One is authentic relating, and the other one is appreciative inquiry. So could you start by, t- I know these are, these are both very different concepts, uh, uh, or maybe not, but can you start by telling us what is authentic relating and what is appreciative inquiry? Sure. Uh, these are great questions, Henry. I'm happy to, to answer them as best I can. Uh, and I think you'll find that they're actually more related than they initially seem to be. Um, authentic relating is a is an approach that has people getting present to whatever is really true for themselves and then getting present to other people from that place of their own truth. So we have events, um, often public events, where people get together and we facilitate exercises that have folks get connected, feel connected to one another in profound ways. Um, and that's really, what, that's really what it is. These, these events, we call them games nights, uh, and we do what we call authentic relating games. And these are just processes that, um, that connect human beings in ways that we don't necessarily connect on a daily basis. And it's really fun at times, but it can also be profound and really beautiful. And uh, you, so you started talking about authentic relating and authentic relating being uh, the events and games that you run that allow people to connect with each other on, on a deeper level. And so to answer the second part of my question, tell me what is appreciative inquiry? And I know uh, these, as, as you said, they may not, uh, the connection may not be as distant uh, between these two uh, as it may seem at first. So what is appreciative inquiry? Appreciative inquiry started off as a consulting methodology, uh, but in a broader sense, appreciative inquiry is, is a philosophy and a way of life. So okay. the, the easiest way to, to, to describe it is that it's based on the notion that what we appreciate, appreciates. Mm-hmm. So what we're putting our attention on and, and you know, giving our focus to um, tends to expand. There was a gentleman named David Kuberreiter who was a uh, PhD student at the time in the mid 80s. And he was working with the corporation and the corporation was having trouble. And they asked him uh, you know, to look at, the, at their processes and to tell them what their problems were. So he went through a thorough investigation, started asking folks within the organization and some of the stakeholders um, to talk about their problems. And he noticed that as he was doing this, the morale and the energy level of the people he was interacting with would drop significantly the more they started talking about their problems. So he thought to himself, you know, whatever everyone else is doing, do the opposite. So he decided instead of investigating problems to start to look at what really worked within the organization. Mm -hmm. So he started creating these interviews with people using questions um, that that are called unconditionally positive questions. So it would be something like, tell me about an occasion where you were working with a client and you just knocked it out of the park. You were really successful. You really helped them. It made a big difference or, tell me about a time when you were really proud of your team and how they operated together, or tell me some things that you love about working for this company. 
or tell me what it is about the company mission that really turns you on. So, you know, it's, it's these open-ended questions that are intentionally designed to elicit positive um, sentiment. And what starts to happen is that people begin to get present to all the things that are really magical. Um, mm -hmm. In the pursuit of inquiry, we call it the positive core. Mm -hmm. What is it that actually gives life to your team, to your organization? And then from that place, then they start to, to imagine, you know, what could it be like if we were operating from these states all of the time? So then from that, from that place of, uh, of optimism, then they start to dream about what they can create. Mm -hmm. And then these dreams, they then start to back them up with plans and mm -hmm. projects, and then mm -hmm. they carry them out. Um, and then this approach becomes something that they can iterate at every level of the organization. It actually becomes an MO or it has the potential to become a way of operating at every level of the organization where people are asking instead of, hey, what's our problem here? Instead, they ask, what's possible? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all kinds of amazing things come out of that. Mm. And I, I, I am somewhat familiar with appreciative inquiry just because appreciative inquiry is, is used very often as a tool in mediation. Now, the first time I tried to use appreciative inquiry um, as a young mediator, um, I had a difficult experience. Um, I was mediating a dispute between a married, between a married couple. Mm -hmm. And I asked them, I asked them the question, what, how were things when they were good? And, they, they, you know, this couple was having some, some issues and they were talking about splitting up. And the answer was, well, things were never good. Mm -hmm. You know, things, things were never good. And, 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 and in fact, um, the one, one person present there almost chastised me a little bit for making the assumption um, that, you know, things were good. Uh, mm -hmm. At, at some point. It is an assumption that sometimes I like to make, but I'm wondering how do we get, uh, in appreciative inquiry, how do we get around uh, sometimes the perception uh, that people have that nothing was good? Uh, because of course, as we know, um, memory is not something, um, memory is something we're creating constantly, even as, as we speak. It's not necessarily something and neuro, modern neuroscience is showing that. But how do we deal from, from, from appreciative inquiry perspective with a situation where someone can't think uh, of anything positive? And, and, and on the contrary, that brings up the negative experiences that the person had. You know, it's a really great question that you raised there, Henry. And uh, I, I don't know that I have a, a, an, an awesome answer for the question, to be honest with mm -hmm. you. Um, you know, I think if there's, if, if there's really nothing, you know, it, it would be just like in a marriage, you know, mm -hmm. uh, if, if a couple has fond memories and there's really something beautiful um, to draw on, then, then a couple's therapist could, can do a lot with that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if there's really nothing there, mm -hmm. uh, it's probably going to be tough. It probably mm -hmm. will be really tough. Um, you know, my experience, and, I, and I'm sure that probably for you and your work as well, is that when people have a complaint, mm -hmm. uh, it's best not to resist the complaint. Mm -hmm. If you can give a space for them to vent and to say what they need to say and really be heard. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times people walk around with these complaints for years and all they need is someone to just hear them. Mm -hmm. uh, and once they feel like they've been heard and that their, their voice has, has been given a space to be, um, you know, to be expressed, then they can, they can let go of their attachment to, you know, to being right about how awful things are. And they might open up and start to think about what could be possible. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think that there are some ways to, you know, to, maybe, to maybe start to, to work in that direction. But, uh, but it is certainly a challenge. Mm. And I think in some ways this brings us back to uh, something we started with, and, and that is the connection uh, between appreciative inquiry and authentic relating. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Because I, I, I was fortunate enough to participate in an authentic relating event, but also a lot of the work that I do is very similar. 
-hmm. at least in principle. Um, I sometimes get people who are uh, you know, going through difficulties in, in, in their life, and, and that's where they're struggling to, to relate generally. Uh, and, and we try to create space so that they can relate authentically. But something that I noticed was, you know, when you look into someone's eyes, can be an uncomfortable experience, certainly. Mm -hmm. And I actually think the power of that experience really comes in when we stop, when we drop the labels. Is it mm -hmm. good? It's po mm -hmm. bad? It's positive? It's negative? You know, when we just allow ourselves to have an experience without trying to uh, reduce it to some kind of label or definition or description. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in that term, can you talk a little bit more about how the, the, the interaction, um, you know, at least on a conceptual level, on a principal mm -hmm. level, between authentic relating and appreciative inquiry? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. I love the question. Uh, we recently had a, a, a meeting. I'm, I'm a partner with the Corporation for Positive Change, which is a, an organization that, that, that works um, with appreciative inquiry as the foundation um, of, of all the work that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had a, a, a meeting at my house where all my partners got together, and they hadn't actually seen the, or the um, uh, authentic relating before. Mm -hmm. So I had an event at my house where they could all get a taste of it. And, uh, and now we're looking at our, the, the president, for example, was going right out to California as soon as he left my house to do some work with a the, with the client. And he was already thinking about how he could integrate the authentic relating into this appreciative inquiry work that he was doing with this client mm -hmm. in California. And, you know, what I'm seeing here is that in the appreciative inquiry um, process, we use what's called a 4D cycle, which is discovery, dream, design, and destiny. So the first part of that is, is this love soup, so to speak, where everyone's you know, asking these questions and coming up with, with, with all this positive sentiment. Um, and it's, it's, it's that foundation, that basis of, of positive narrative that gets generated that then allows for this authentic optimism to be present from which people can then dream and start the second phase of the process. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and really without that piece of it being successful, there's really no point. I mean, the rest of it really just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So the link that I'm seeing between the two um, pro, uh, the two you know, modalities is that authentic relating creates strong affinity between people. Mm -hmm. And when there's that strong affinity, that creates a fertile ground where collaborative brainstorming can be happening and these possibilities can start to be generated. Mm -hmm. um, it makes an enormous difference when that's happening and appreciative inquiry is brilliant at making that happen. It happens with strangers. We see people come in who haven't known each other prior to the event. And by the time that they've left, they say, I feel like I have people in this room that are better friends than people that I've known mm -hmm. for years, just after a couple of hours. Hard to imagine, but it's true. And, you know, and within organizations, we see people coming together and playing authentic relating games and they're able to connect with each other in ways that the, the structure and the roles that they play on a day-to-day -day basis would not allow. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so within the workplace, there are these ways that we, these roles that we occupy. Mm -hmm. And then we relate to each other from our roles and then that defines the kinds of connections and, and interactions that we have. There's a whole world of possible connections that, they, that exist outside of those walls. And that's what happens when you do authentic relating. Mm -hmm. So this past weekend, I was actually giving a talk at a um, conference on uh, you know, different, different organizational, organizational psycholo psychology and methodologies. And this one was dealing with agility and, and, and requisite and the requisite, requisite agility. And one thing I, I led a uh, I, one of the talks I gave there was on building, not uh, moving from away from building teams and towards building communities. 
uh, mm -hmm. at the workplace uh, with, with the understanding that when we have a deeper connection with each other uh, and, and where we share something more than just work tasks, uh, we work better together. And one of the participants uh, at the talk had an objection. And her concern was, look, she said, she doesn't feel, you know, she, she's working with these people and she feels, um, on one hand, yes, she does want to get to know them. But on the other hand, she wants to maintain certain, you know, certain distance um, from, from her colleagues because they're her colleagues and not get too personal and not um, maybe engage with her colleagues in a way that uh, would really have her open up. So there was a level of fear and level of discomfort with that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that, on balancing. On one hand, this, I think, our fundamental need to connect with each other mm -hmm. with uh, our conditioning to naturally be cautious and to naturally, yeah, maybe not let strangers, so people we perceive as strangers or people with, people with whom we have a certain boundary, mm -hmm. not letting them mm -hmm. in too close, not letting them through uh, that wall of boundary that we build. Yes, well, boundaries are important, right? It's important that we have um, some boundaries, that we have safety. I mean, these are important things. Um, I don't think that, uh, that dropping all of our defenses uh, is necessarily a great idea. Um, that would be a bad idea. But at the same time, I think that a lot of our defenses are um, stronger than they need to be. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, there may be the opportunity or the, or the, you know, the, the option with people to drop a little bit and get a little bit closer. And even, you know, even to a small degree, if we open up and, and find a deeper connection with someone, um, all kinds of possibilities are available that weren't available before. Mm -hmm. So when we do authentic relating, if we have a typical games night, one of the agreements that we have at the very beginning, we let people know, you know, one thing that you're doing in this process, in this games night, is that you are playing with your edge. You know, there's an edge where you feel comfortable and then there's an, then you kind of start to push the edge a little bit and you start to notice your discomfort. Like you're getting to the place where you feel like you're, like you're on, the, on the verge of not feeling safe enough anymore. Mm -hmm. So we have people practice with that or at least develop an awareness of their edge. Mm -hmm. And the greater our awareness is of our personal edge in different areas, <clears throat> we might find that, that it's, it's not necessary that our edge be so, um, so tightly drawn. Mm -hmm. and maybe there's more space there. Maybe there is maybe this person, for example, that we felt uncomfortable with in our office uh, maybe as we do an authentic relating event with them, we realize like we've got more in common than we thought we did. Maybe we, maybe we feel really endeared to them mm -hmm. in a way that we never did before. And we can see that they're endeared to us as well. And then suddenly you know, we're both sort of excited because we want to, because we want to nurture this possibility between us. We feel like there's something that could actually happen. We could actually become friends, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and, you know, it doesn't mean that you're going to tell them your deepest, darkest secrets necessarily. You're still going to be prudent about it, but, you know, things start to move. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because I, when I uh, have done authentic relating type exercise, both at your event and, and at some of the other experiences that I had, the remarkable thing that happens is actually you connect with someone not because of their story, but actually without their story. So very often um, you may have a deep connection with someone who you may not even know their name yeah. or you wouldn't even know anything, you know, any of the sort of standard, you know, cocktail party things 
kind of their their the the work that they do or where they live or or uh, who their partner is is whether yeah. they have a partner. And so, to me, um, there was certain power in connecting to someone beyond the typical story, beyond the typical sort of shell mm -hmm. that we because that shell also allows us, I think, to reduce people to yeah. labels and to reduce people to boxes. So, you know, yeah. this person is this profession or this gender or, uh, and, and we start making these intrinsic judgments about a person. And actually what I thought was so powerful that we didn't know a lot about the other folks there. Mm -hmm. uh, and that made the experience of looking into their eyes um, so much more powerful than if you knew that this person is an accountant or lawyer or, uh, you know, whatever it is. So I'm wondering if you have any comment on that. Well, what you're pointing to is, is, is possibly the greatest power of authentic relating mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is that it, is that it dissolves and transcends these uh, structures, you know, you mm -hmm. call them stories and they are, they're, they're stories, you know, Mm -hmm. I have a particular story um, about myself, my identity, mm -hmm. then, you know, my identity might be such that I'm not able to relate to someone else who has an identity, you know, if that if part of their identity is to not like people who share my identity. Mm -hmm. you know, so, for example, if I were to get a, a Palestinian and a, and a Jew together, mm -hmm. I could put them in the same room, and if I were to say to them, you know, talk to me about the the conflict in the Middle East, <clears throat> and tell me your opinions about whose fault it is, mm -hmm. you know, by the end of the conversation, somebody could be dead, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if I were to say, have a seat, and then let's talk about, um, tell me about your children, tell me what you tell me, tell me a story about something that one of your children did that just made you laugh. That was so cute. Mm -hmm. They started sharing stories. Are they, you know, or tell me something about your father and why you love your father so much, you know, and they started sharing things about, you know, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And suddenly there's this connection, there's this humanity, and it's, and it's um, the story and the roles that they play and their identity as Palestinians or Jews um, isn't relevant in that conversation. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a shared humanity that becomes more important, and then they can connect there. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what you think of this, David. So for me, for me uh, when, I, when I notice that we're able to go beyond, you know, the story and the identity, and, and, and we touch upon this common humanity, I, I found that this common humanity is very much connected to our most fundamental needs. And these needs go beyond our conditioning, beyond uh, where we may come from. So these needs, as I see them, um, is a need for security the need for authenticity, that, we're, that we are somehow showing up authentically in our life, the need for connection, the need for meaning in our life, the need for expansion, for us to expand beyond, you know, beyond whatever box that, that, we, that we are in, be it our uh, role or profession or our ethnicity, race, gender, all, all of those things. So I'm wondering if you find um, that... When people, and, and this is actually in, in both hats that you're wearing, whether you're doing appreciative inquiry or whether you're doing authentic relating, mm -hmm. whether it is the connection to that, that humanity is actually the connection to our most fundamental needs um, that we have that allows us to connect with each other on that very basic, fundamental, and also very deep level. I, yeah, I think that's exactly, that's exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, in our, in our world today, we don't have many, um, we don't have many opportunities for that. Mm. It's difficult to, to find opportunities to uh, skip the small talk, so to speak, mm -hmm. and really feel a connection with, with another human being. You know, if I, if I go to a public event or I go to a, you know, some sort of networking event, Mm -hmm. If someone says to me, hey, how are you doing? Chances are I'm just going to say, great, how are you? Mm -hmm. and the answer is going to be the same, regardless of how I'm actually feeling. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm not going to be 
changing my answer to say, ah, it mm -hmm. horribly, you know, like my wife and I just had an argument before I left the house and I'm like, I, I can't mm -hmm. stop thinking about it. And, you know, I'm stressed out at work and <clears throat> I haven't got enough exercise yet, you know, this like for, it's been like a month since I've worked out and I feel horrible and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like I could, you know, like, I'm not going to say that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, so there's this, so there's this trap that we find ourselves in where we have, where we sort of have to interact according to certain protocols with one another. And it's not, it's not real. It's not the mm -hmm. truth. It's not what's actually happening. And I think that we're, it's sort of like water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink. Like we're, we're, we're surrounded with, with connections with human beings that are, that are superficial and they're not real, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And I think another interesting point here is that to truly con authentically connect with someone is not about actually having that person agree with you or say something that, that you know, you would, you would say. There are so many echo chambers now, uh, you know, on, on the internet and other forums where people can be with people, validate sort of their, their worldview, validate their opinions, mm -hmm. and yet that feels so different. <clears throat> you know, from truly authentically connecting with another person. It actually has nothing to do, from my experience, uh, and I wonder what, what, you, what, what your thoughts are on this, with um, agreeing or disagreeing with a person. Them validating how you see the world or your worldview or not validating how you see the worldview. In fact, I, with the folks that I met at your event, I had no idea what their um, you know, political views or affiliations or whether I would agree with them uh, with some things or not, it, it did not matter at all. What you're saying is, is really profound, Henry, and I think it's, it's unbelievably important. Mm -hmm. I think that if we were to actually just take this one notion that you're, that you're unpacking here mm -hmm. and really work with it, we could, we could change the world. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that, that as human beings, that we're not required to operate and to interact with one another from our opinions. Mm -hmm. We don't have to be two opinions coming at each other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, never, I'm really, I, I, I feel like uh, there's so much more to mm -hmm. us than our opinions. Mm -hmm. And to me, love is granting being to someone exactly as they are. Mm -hmm. It includes their opinions and their perspectives, but I don't need to agree with your perspective to grant you being, mm -hmm. to love you for, for who you are. Mm -hmm. It's not necessary for me to, to bend you to my perspective, to bend you to my um, opinion mm -hmm. as a condition for you to be okay for me. Mm -hmm. And I think you're touching on something um, very, very deep here. And something very deep here is we're so focused on the quest for truth, you know. Uh, but whose truth is it? Is it my truth? Is it your truth? Is it the truth that's written in one book or another book? That I think we forget that's really it's about the truth of who we are. And that's the fundamental truth, you know, that there is no opinion there. And the fundamental truth of who we are is love. Mm. And when we touch upon that, that expand and it's not a concept it's not an intellectual idea it's an overwhelming experience of who we are that is undeniable mm -hmm. once we touch upon that it seems that all the all the things that separate that separate us and my truth and your truth and this is your background and this is my background and this is how you like to do things and this is how i like to do things all of that drops. And then we can really have the experience of being waves, different waves, unique waves of the same ocean. Mm. And knowing that that ocean is always connecting us and we're always part of it. You're speaking my language, Henry. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I am, I'm a student of love. Yeah. I, I feel that, you know, I think Alexander Pope, if I'm not mistaken, said that, that human beings are, are find themselves somewhere between angels and apes. Yes. And, uh, you know, we have a long way to go. Um, right. And I feel that with myself as well, you know, as much as I like to think of myself as a, 
you know, emotionally intelligent guy. And however I like to think of myself, I always find that I'm bumping up against my ability to be effective with people and in love. Uh, so I find that this is a huge learning curve and, you know, love is, love is something that's, that's, that's surrounded by so many cliches that it's sometimes difficult to really, to really feel the, the, um, the importance of it, like as something relevant and real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I feel that above all else, that that learning curve is, is means everything to me. Mm. And so let's talk a little bit about this, this learning curve. Uh, you know, you, you're doing some very, very profound work as we, as we, as we talked about. So I'm curious, Dave, how did you, what brought you to this? How did you get in uh, to working with human connection? on this, on such a deep level, on such an authentic level, uh, and on such, in many ways, revolutionary level. What brought you here? Well, I, you know, I, uh, I feel like I'm just getting started with all of this. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, what, what got me into it was that I was lonely. Mm -hmm. I moved to Philadelphia. I fell in love and I moved here to be with the woman who is now my wife. Uh, mm -hmm. Greatest thing I ever did. But when I got here, I didn't know anyone and uh, I had a hard time. Mm -hmm. you know, I found that when I would go to a social occasion, I would have, uh, you know, 20 consecutive 30 second conversations mm -hmm. and I would scratch the surface. And I really, I, I, I think of myself as someone who's, um, I'm intense and I like to have like really intense, meaningful conversations with people. I crave it. Uh, you know, so I would, I wanted to find a way to, to have that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so what I did was I created a meetup group called the human love project. And I started inviting people into my home to just start talking about love and how to be a, you know, how to, how to love each other better. You know, just this sort of awkward, hard to articulate uh, question, you know, that I feel is a really important question. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And uh, and I was fumbling around with these exercises, trying to create some way to, to manufacture this, this really profound connection with people. And it was, it was pretty good. Mm -hmm. Then I discovered authentic relating and I saw that there was this sort of ready-made, um, you know, program where some folks had spent a lot of time sort of perfecting this, this methodology. So it was something that I could just plug into and run with. And it was, you know, it was, it was more refined and more perfected than what I was sort of fumbling with on my own. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I started leading authentic relating events and I've been doing that now for about a, about a year, a little over a year. Um, yeah. And, is, and, and so is this what you're doing with the, I know you're a facilitator with Let's Be Authentic Company, the company that Rachel Whitworth started. Uh, so tell, tell us more about that uh, initiative that you, Rachel, and I believe there is another, there is another person who's doing this. Yael is her name, I think, or? There's actually four of us. in. in oh, I apologize. Yeah, there, there are four of us in Philadelphia who are actively leading events. Uh, I started leading them. Um, Ashley King, who's a psychotherapist, uh, had been leading them, um, although she hadn't been leading them very regularly, and, and I did one of her events and got really turned on by it. Um, mm -hmm. But she wasn't doing them very often, so I just decided that I would start doing some of them myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I started scheduling these events. And then mm -hmm. um, later, Ashley and I started doing events together, which we're still doing. And, uh, and then Rachel started leading events and she's been leading them. Uh, and then there's also this, um, this other friend of ours, Lael Rush, mm -hmm. who also leads them. So Lael and Rachel will lead them together. Um, mm -hmm. Rachel and I will lead them together. Ashley mm -hmm. and I will lead them together. Uh, sometimes I'll lead them solo by myself. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're sort of this foursome that just kind of mixes and matches different events that we put together. Mm. So what is the vision for you going forward uh, with both authentic relating uh, and appreciative inquiry and the human love project, which, which I think you're also involved 
all the wonderful things you're doing to foster human connection? What's the vision? Well, I'd like to see the appreciative, I'd like to see the, the authentic relating um, become more integrated with the appreciative inquiry. I think that there's a natural fit there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, within the Corporation for Positive Change, we're, we're looking at, you know, really expanding our offering and making it, you know, uh, much, a much broader offering than just strictly appreciative inquiry. I think appreciative inquiry will still sort of operate in the background of all that we do. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot more that we can offer as well. Uh, and a, a bringing in the authentic relating, I think, will we'll really enrich what we're doing there. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd also like to see the authentic relating um, within organizations. I recently did it within a corporation a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, was, that was phenomenal. It really helped them to create connections within their, uh, within their organization that, that you know, were harder to create without this mm -hmm. facilitation. So I feel like you know, there's, there's a real potential to bring this into the organizational level. And then of course, into the public as well. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and so far we've only been doing this in a very narrow uh, niche. You know, mm -hmm. there's a, there's a, we have a consistent group of people who get together and we're, you know, we have solid events and so forth. But, you know, there's such a huge market, really, you know, so many people have a desire and a craving to connect with one another in a more meaningful way. And this is a very easy, you know, the, the bar is very low for this and the impact is huge. Mm. Very, very helpful. So if someone, one of our listeners, you know, wanted to participate in, in an authentic relating event, um, what, what can they do? Well, there's, um, there's a number of ways to do it. So, you know, as I mentioned, all four of us, uh, mm -hmm. that's Rachel Whitworth, Lel Rush, Ashley King, and myself, David Reed. We each um, lead these, sometimes independently and sometimes in collaboration with one another. Mm -hmm. So um, right now there's probably at least four different places that you can get information about that. Um, mm -hmm. One of them is my organization, which is Human Love Project. And you can go to humanloveproject.com. Mm -hmm. uh, there is uh, Psychoalchemy, which is Ashley's um, group. Mm -hmm. if, you go to, if you go to Facebook, you could just type in Psychoalchemy and find her there. Um, Lael's group is Philly Conscious Connections. You could find that also on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And then Rachel's group is Let's Be Authentic, and you can find uh, her on letsbeauthentic.com. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And uh, so between the four of us, we have, we have a lot of events going on. And we'll have all of these in the, in the, in the description for the podcast so that the uh, folks who listen can can click on the links and check check out these communities and are all these communities centered around the Philadelphia area these are all centered around the Philadelphia area um, there's authentic relating happening all over the place I mean there's there's big communities in DC New York mm -hmm. um, Austin is a is an especially large community it's happening mm -hmm. uh, all over the world mm. so there's a lot of places that's wonderful, David. Well, I'm so happy that we had an opportunity to chat. I really hope that this conversation is an ongoing one uh, because I think we are in the, same, in the same general space, in the same field, and I hope that we'll uh, be finding ways to support each other and to support human connection, fostering human connection, authentic dialogue, authentic relating, and deep transformative conversations. I, 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 my vision is really that we have more of those. And I think um, what you're doing uh, is contributing greatly to uh, really introducing a very new and transformative and powerful paradigm in the world that is very much needed now. So thank you, Dave. Thank you for joining us on the Living Peace Podcast. Thank you, Henry. It's been a pleasure.